Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, At the same time came his disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this is kind of an odd question that they ask here. Well, maybe not so much odd, but it's definitely something that uh, people, when we read this or we preach about it, we definitely take note of the fact that this question is even being asked. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of unique. We're going to see here in a minute. It's something that it seems like it was kind of a, 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 something that was on the disciples' minds. It's something that came up more than one time. It's something that Jesus addressed more than once. And, you know, I've heard some people say that it's not, it was nothing really shameful that they asked. It wasn't anything foolish. And I, and I would agree with that to an extent. But it kind of shows you where their mind was, you know, when a lot. And it seems like when they had this on their minds, it was during some really odd, like, you know, during some real uh, odd time. It was just an odd time to have a question on your, like this on your mind. I mean, we'll see here in a minute, it was like at the Last Supper this comes up. They ask this, this similar question, and Jesus addresses it. So it just seems like, you know, there's nothing wrong, of course, with wanting to do our best. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best that we can as far as Christians. But the Bible does talk about when we start getting into comparing ourselves with one another, that that is not a wise thing to do. And sometimes I feel like, and maybe I don't have, maybe I don't have the, the, the tone of what, how this was said, or maybe I'm wrong, but to me it just seems like sometimes when they ask this question, who is the greatest, that maybe they weren't asking it, you know, with the right motives. That maybe they were being a little bit carnal. Sometimes that's what I tend to think. Um, I could be wrong about that. You know, someone, I'm obviously, I'm not the greatest, so you could definitely, you know, correct me on that. But uh, the Bible says there that they ask that question, who is the greatest? And, you know, the disciples, this is something that seems like they disputed over. It seems like it's something that they had contention over. And if you would, turn over to Mark chapter 9. Keep something in Matthew 18, but look over at Mark chapter 9. You know, I have to imagine when they were asking this question, because this is something that we'll see here that they disputed among, them, among themselves. It says there, if you're in Mark chapter 9, look at verse 33, and he came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, what is it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. So this wasn't just a friendly discussion. The Bible makes it real clear that they were disputing. Yeah. You know, this was an argument. They were, and I, I tend to think they probably weren't like the other one wasn't trying to make the case for the other one. You know, Andrew wasn't saying, no, Peter's the best. You know, Peter's the greatest. They were probably arguing their own case. Yeah. Like, may, maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think that's kind of human nature. They kind of want to, you know, we, we, re, we remember what... Uh, you know, James and John's uh, mother asked of Jesus that, that, that she would grant unto them, her sons, that they would sit by him in, in, uh, at his right and left hand, or on his right hand in, in, in the kingdom. And Jesus said, it's not given unto me to, you know, it is, I'm drawing a blank, but it wasn't for him to give, you know, the seating arrangements of heaven. Yeah. That it was his father who was going to decide that. So we can see that they were probably trying to make their own case of why they're going to be the greatest. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think human nature, that's just kind of... You know, that's probably what was going on there. And it's interesting here that in Mark, where it says, when he, Jesus kind of calls him out, it says, hey, what were you disputing amongst yourselves, by the way? You know, I love how God asks questions often that he already knows the answer to, just to kind of see how we'll react. Mm -hmm. And he does that all the way back in Genesis. You know, did thou eat of the tree of knowledge yeah. of good and evil? Mm -hmm. and, we kind of, and, and we instantly see man as just a blame shifter. Right? <laughs> the woman that thou gavest me, she, she gave them to me and I did eat. Sure. But she goes, he goes to the woman and asks her, uh, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And that's just kind of human nature. They don't really always want to fess up. We always want to. We're real quick in human nature to just lie, or tell a half truth, or a non-confession to just kind of make our because we don't want to lose face. You know, we don't want to. We don't want to uh, look bad in front of others. And that's kind of what happens here. Jesus is kind of calling them on it, you know, and then what is, what is their reaction? They held their peace. You know, that's a, a non-answer is not an answer. You know, that's that's a non-answer. And I think maybe we're part of the reason why they held their peace is kind of like when Jesus catches them, you know, at the end of the book of John, fishing, you know, and they realize it's the Lord and, and no man said anything. It's kind of an awkward moment where they realize they kind of got caught red-handed. This is kind of maybe one of those instances. It was kind of embarrassing maybe to have Jesus like have to work this out for him. You know, that's just kind of how I read this. That's my opinion. You know, that's not, I don't think that maybe you have a different opinion that's fine. But I definitely think that we can at least all agree that to sit there and compare ourselves among ourselves, as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, is not wise. It says, For we dare not make ourselves with a number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. 
you know, I'm going to be the greatest because so this, that, and the other reason. I'm commending myself and I'm going to compare. Therefore, I'm greater than you because you, X, Y, and Z. You know, commending ourselves by comparing ourselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It's not wise to do that. To sit there and wonder who's going to be the greatest. You know, who's the greatest soul winner? Who's... And I've had people do this. I've literally, you know, the, uh, one bozo who's no longer in this church. And he was a bozo. You know, I remember being in the car with him and, and someone had preached about David's mighty men, uh, who were the mightiest, you know. And, and he remember him asking me, he said, he said, who do you think the mightiest are at that faith Lord Baptist church? And he was dead serious. Who do you think the mightiest are? I said, I don't know. Do you really expect, do you think I sit around thinking about that? <laughs> like, he was the greatest guy at faith Lord, you know. And uh, he probably wanted me to, he wanted to hear me say, well, you, of course. <laughs> But, you know, people do really get this kind of an attitude. They get this kind of mentality of thinking they're going to start comparing themselves to other people. And, you know, if they can find somebody that's not as good as them in some area, they can, they can say, well, that makes me even better. And they want to puff themselves up. And they that do that are not wise. And it's not something we should be disputing over. And kind of, this comes up again. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke 22, this is, of course, at the Last Supper. I mean, the, Jesus says in Luke 22, he says, And truly, Son of Man, goeth as was determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to inquire themselves of them which it, should, uh, that it was that should do this thing. So Jesus is telling at the Last Supper, you know, this is my body broken for you. This, you know, this is, my, this is the cup of the New Testament, which is my blood, drink ye all. And he's, he's instituting, you know, the, the New Testament. He's telling about how he's going to suffer and die. How the one that betrayed him, the hand of the one that betrayed him is, is with him on the table. And what do they get caught up doing? And this, it just seems like a really odd moment for them to have this come up. And it says in verse 24, And there was also a strife among them, which should be accounted the greatest. So this wasn't just them you know, trying to be their best or just trying to say, you know, how can we be a better Christian? I mean, this is something, it says they disputed among themselves. It says this is something that they uh, had strife among themselves over. Yeah. About which of them should be accounted the greatest. You know, which one of us is going to sit the nearest Jesus in his kingdom. And this is the kind of thing that they thought about. And, you know, they, here's the thing. The bottom line, I don't, you know, there is going to be somebody who's greatest in heaven. You know, there's going to be some Christian that's just off the charts, just God is going to commend them very highly for their work's sake. They're going to be honored before Amen. God and men. Yep. But I'm going to tell you something. If that person were in this room, we wouldn't even know. Because they wouldn't go around bragging about that's it. That's right. They would, they would come across, you know, and, and in all likelihood, they, they, they aren't, they're not in this room, right? The odds aren't very good. There's been millions of Christians that have lived, but we wouldn't even know it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't even really matter because the greatest in heaven is God. Amen. I mean, that's what heaven's going to be about. We're going to be there to extol God and to praise God and give Him all the glory. I mean, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Amen. And that's really what, if you have that kind of mentality, then you can just, you don't have to sit there and worry about who's going to be the greatest. Now, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to be the best Christian that you can be. That's something that we should all strive for. But that's something that we're always going to have to you know, press toward the mark and, and, and reach forward for. And that's something that we have to attain unto. You know, that's never, you're never going to get to a point in your Christian life where you're going to say, I made it. I'm the best that I can be. I'm the greatest Christian I can be. You know, you could, we could always be better because we have, we're not perfect because we haven't reached that. You know, and Jesus is God. And if He's the greatest in heaven... So, you know, if we want to be the greatest in heaven, if that's our motive, then we should look to Jesus and see what kind of traits he exhibited here on earth. How would Jesus behave? What did he do that would make him great? Well, we, when we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see servitude and we see humility. I mean, those are two attributes that Jesus Christ had here on this earth that we ought to all, you know, use in our own life. Because really, that's what the Christian life is about, is about service. I mean, that's why we're in the ministry, to minister to people. You know, we go out and knock doors and try to get people saved, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back and feel good, but that we can actually, you know, minister to a lost soul and, and get them to heaven yeah. and help them understand the gospel. So that takes a certain level of humility to be a servant in that way, to take your time and your energy and your resources to put that towards the work of God. That is a type of uh, being a type of servant, and that requires humility on our part. Now, if you would, look over at John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I mean, if we want to be the greatest in heaven, then we should look to the greatest example. 
of the greatest in heaven, which is Jesus Christ. And we'll see what he did here. It says in John 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus uh, knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world and as a father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now that's, that's saying something, right? What we're about to see Jesus do here, I mean, you have to keep that. What, what we're going to see him do here in a minute when he washes their feet, you have to keep that in mind in the light of the verse that we just read. That he's ready to depart out of the world unto his father. That he's ready to go and be you know, back with his father again in his glory, in his kingdom. I mean, he's, he's been here. He's done the work. You know, his ministry's coming to an end. I mean, when we kind of get to the end of a thing, a lot of time that's when we start to slack. Yeah. Because, yeah, well, it's almost over. You know what I mean? We just kind of, we can just kind of phone it in from here. You know, this is almost done. But that's not what Jesus did. And it says there in verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So he's getting near the end of his uh, end of his ministry. He's about to be betrayed. He's about to go into the most difficult situation anyone's ever been in. You know, the most painful and just you know uh, uh, night and day that anyone's ever suffered. He's going to go through all that. His ministry is almost over. And verse three, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, what does he do? He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I mean, in the light of everything, at this moment, for him to do this at this moment in ministry, I mean, at any moment it would have been really something to have the Son of God do this to you, to minister you in this way. But when he has, you know, he's the night of his, before he's, he's executed, you know, he's been betrayed. He's about to go into his father where his ministry is coming to an end. Knowing that his father has given him to all things. I mean, if anyone had a, had a right to just sit back and say, you know what, I got too, I'm too busy. I got too much on my plate right now to worry about other people. It was Jesus. But he sets the example for us and he pours that water in the basin. He girds himself and he goes about and he washes the feet of the disciples. I mean, that's real service. That's real humility. That's really ministering to the saints. And that... It is why Jesus, you know, that's one reason we can say that that's the greatest in heaven. That is the example of the greatest in heaven, that a man, that Jesus Christ did that. And this whole attitude of comparing ourselves amongst one another, trying to determine whether or not, you know, one of us is better at something than another one, you know, it's not conducive to the Christian life. It's completely, it's opposite of the Christian life. It's taking you the other direction. Yeah. It's the wrong attitude to have. This is the attitude we got to have. You know, Jesus said, Neither be ye called master, for one is your master in Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. I mean, that it seems like it's 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 a you know it's an oxymoron. It's 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 a paradox to sit there and say, if you want to be the greatest, then you'll be the servant. But that's that's the Christian life. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. It's completely contrary to reason. But that's how the Christian life works. And if we want to be exalted, you know, then we have to, you know, the way down is up, as has been said. And really, we're, we're called to humility. That's the, that's the Christian life. In order to be a, a servant for God the way we ought to be, you know, we have to exhibit this same characteristic that Jesus had, which is humility. That is something that has to be a part of who we are. The Bible says in uh, <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16, better, better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly that divide the spoil with the proud. It says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. I mean, this is just a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Likewise, the younger, it says in 1 Peter 5, Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. You know, instead of sitting around comparing ourselves one to another, the Bible says we should be actually be subject one to another. You know, we should be, work, you know, we should be uh, you know, not looking on our own things, but on the needs of others. We should be looking on, on everybody's needs. We should be clothed with humility, it says. I mean, just as much as you would get up in the morning and, you know, put on your clothes. You, you know, part of that garment that we need to put on is humility. I mean, we would walk out without having to get dressed. But I wonder how many times we walk out without having put on humility. And that's a big part of the Christian life. And, it, you know, that's uh, something we have to have. <clears throat> Because the Bible says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Amen. I don't want God to resist me. I don't want God's grace. I want God's help. Well, how much humility are you showing? You know, how much, how much are you willing to give of yourself? How much are you willing to become a servant unto others? And put aside your own desires, your own wants, 
and just allow God to use you to serve others. <clears throat> so that's kind of a big, you know, uh, lesson that we can learn here just from these, you know, this this one verse. You know, there's so much packed in there. This one question: Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, is that really even our concern? Is that really even something we should be worried about? Or should we just look to the example of Jesus Christ and just learn to be humble servants here on earth? And if God sees fit to exalt us here on earth, so be it. And if He doesn't, so be it. You know, and we'll receive a reward for the works which we have done in heaven. And maybe that's that's you know, some men's works are you know are 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 open beforehand, and some men, and some men uh, they they follow after. The Bible says. So that's you know, we might not even see our rewards here on earth. We might not be exalted here on earth. Maybe we really are humble. Maybe we really are. You know, just servants who genuinely just want to help others. You might live your whole lifetime and never see, you know, see your name in lights. You know, you might never be on YouTube. You might never, the pastor might never say your name. No one's ever going to come up to you and say, hey, good job at this or good job at that. Or give you some kind of praise. But so what? God, God keeps track of it all. And, you know, maybe it's just going to be for you that you get receive that reward in heaven. Yeah. So it goes on here in verse 2 in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 18, it says in verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's kind of an interesting example, and I think there's kind of two things he's kind of getting across here. There's two things that we can kind of get out of this. Is one that it's, it takes humility to get into heaven. I mean, that's a big part of it. To even get saved takes humility. I'm not saying, you know, that you have to come to church and sit on a mourner's bench, you know, and feel sorry for your sin, and be truly, truly sorry, and repentant, and have, you know, and some people teach that. Mourner's bench is a real thing. You know, we're going we're gonna to preach this person the gospel once they come and sit on this hard pine bench. They really don't do it anymore. But, you know, that used to be a thing. I think it was uh, John Wesley who was really into that. I could be wrong. Maybe it wasn't him. But it was definitely somebody. And that kind of turned into the altar call thing. That's where a lot of these things come from, where it's just this idea that people have to have this deep penitence and just contrition and just be really sorry for the, the just you see themselves as a lowly worm before God and unworthy of all grace. I mean, we really have to bring people to that point to see them get saved to where they're, they're just broken human beings? No. But it does take a certain level of humility to admit, I'm a sinner. And you think, well, that doesn't seem very genuine. That doesn't seem like that's enough. But some people have a real hard time with that. And they go knock on doors in neighborhoods where people are proud. What do they say? Well, I'm a good person. Yeah. That's not saying I'm a sinner who deserves to go to hell. That's the opposite. So it does take a certain level of humility to just be able to admit to the fact that, you know, you're a sinner that deserves to go to hell. And without that, without that basic, just simple humility of being able to admit that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you're not going to make it. Because you can't, you know, what do you need to Jesus for if you're a good, good enough person to go to heaven? And, you know, also another part of that is that it takes a childlike faith to get into heaven. I mean, salvation's easy, folks. It's it's us. We're the ones that make it complicated. Yeah. You know, the, the, the simplicity that is in Christ. It never ceases to amaze me every time someone says, "Yeah, go ahead and show me what the Bible says." Yeah, you go ahead and just read them. Just start to show them that they're a sinner, that all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, that Jesus died for their sins, and so on and so forth. And just to see the light come on, yeah. just to see the Holy Spirit move in their heart, and just the simplicity that is in Christ, and they understand the gospel. And sometimes it's so simple and so easy that we even doubt that that really happened. Like, did that person really get saved? Because it seemed really easy. But you know, for God so loved the world, right. that God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, that's how simple salvation is. That's why children can get saved, because it's that easy. Yeah. That's why a five-year-old, even a four-year-old, even I've heard of three-year-olds, and I believe it, that have an aptitude to understand that there's even children as young as three years old I'm not saying all of them. Kids are all different. Sometimes kids need to be six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Who knows? But I mean, a child can understand the gospel. Yeah. I mean, you think about people who have handicaps, you know, uh, learning disabilities, where it's you know they it's, they're they're never going to learn, you know, math. They're not going to learn just basic. And that kind of thing is going to be difficult for them. People who have real mental handicaps, they can still understand salvation, can't they? They can still get it. They can still be saved. So we see that's one example of. 
of this passage where he's, he's taking this child and he's using it as, a, as, a, as an example of, you know, the fact that it takes humility to get into heaven, but also that, you know, God esteems those... Uh, God kind of... I guess I could say this, that God esteems those who do what they are told highly. I mean, you think about it, like a, when a child, you know, he does what they are told, uh, they, you know, they, they, they receive praise for that. I mean, they're pleased, they're, they're pleasing to their parents. You know, when, we're, when we take a small child and, you know, say, do this or that, you know, they're, they're, that's a ple whether they do that out of obedience or out of fear, whether they want to be pleasing or not, I mean, that's something that we should all desire to have. We should be as that child, one who is willing to obey yeah. and simply just be obedient to God, whether it's because we fear Him or because we love Him. Yeah. That that's part of that too. Let's go ahead and move on to verse 5 where it says, and uh, it says in verse 5, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But who shall offend, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's some heavy, that's, that is not politically correct preaching. All right? That is not what the world philosophy at all today. That does not sound like Jesus is for rehabilitating offenders. No. That doesn't sound like he's for the background check. Amen. In fact, to me, it sounds like he's for the underground check. Yeah. That's what they need. Six feet under. That's, right. That's the kind of the back, you know, the, the check that needs to go on. An underground check. And you know, that's a strong statement, but look at verse 7. And I want us to know before we read this that the way those sentences end have an exclamation point. You know, this isn't just Jesus, you know, being my, he gets worked up about these things. This is something that he feels passionate about. He says, woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. I mean, Jesus knows bad things are going to happen. And that wicked and evil people are going to do wicked and evil things. And he says, woe to them. It's going to happen. You know, and, and who is it that he's talking to about specifically in this passage? Those that would offend children. You know, and it's not in the sense of, you know, they call the child a nasty name. You know, that he's, that's what, not what it means by offend. It means, you know, that they were violated in some way. Or caused, as it says, uh, you know, those that have, one of these ones believe in me. You know, uh, causing a child to not believe in Christ or to offend them in some way. I mean, that, that's a terrible offense in the eyes of God. He says it would be better for you to tie a millstone around your own neck and, 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 and go jump in a lake. That's, that's some heavy preaching right there. And he says, woe to that person. And you say, well, who would that apply to today? You know, well, woe to the public school teacher. Yeah. Sorry, but if you're going to go and teach children that billions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth before man ever was. You know, and start to teach them an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary philosophy that is contrary to the Word of God and cause them to doubt Scripture, yeah. to doubt the, the, the truth of God's Word, woe to you. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's really pretty mild to what's being taught in public schools today. You know, woe to the public school teacher who's going to sit a child down and teach them about sodomy. Yeah. And that kind of thing goes on. Good. To teach them about my two dads. Bill. It's terrible. It'd be better for that school teacher to go tie a rock around their neck and jump in a lake. Amen. Because they're caught, they're offending little ones. They're offending children today. Yeah. And causing them to wander out of the way. Who else? Woe to the entertainment industry. You know, woe to Disney. Right. You know, I'm sorry if you like Disney. Woe to them. Yeah. You know, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. <laughs> That's a woman with a beast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what kind of stuff are we put in their minds? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, they're teaching all kinds of things. I don't want to go off on Disney too much. <laughs> but what are them? It's godless entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, Finding Nemo yeah. with Ellen DeGenerate. Right. Lion King, you know, have Elton John, you know, sing Sweet Nothings in your child's ear. <laughs> oh, who was that? Oh, just some fag yeah. Yeah. playing the piano. You know, it's the circle of life, right? <laughs> I won't go off too much on it. But I mean, that's what's going on. That's yeah. what's being lifted up in this godless entertainment industry. Right. Hannah Montana. That really turned out well, didn't it? <laughs> Get your kids hooked out on, on Hannah Montana, Disney. Oh, no, it's harmless. 
Then she turns around, drops the character, and you know, shows her true colors. Yeah. Some filthy whore. Yeah. That's what Amen. she is. Amen. And how many kids are just gonna follow her off in that into that lead? Right. Influencing their minds, just poisoning their minds with the filth that's out there. Woe to the entertainment industry. Woe to these people. You know, but most of all, woe to the pedophile. Yeah. Amen. You know, woe to those that would harm children physically. And let me tell you, that's something that is getting worse and worse in this country. And it's going to continue to get worse. And that's why you've got to continue to preach this, that you should not let your children out of your sight as much as you are able. Amen. That's why we don't separate kids here in this church. That's why we don't have a separate children's ministry. Because predators look for opportunities to get along with children. And let me tell you something, folks. It only takes a minute. Yeah. It only takes a few seconds. <laughs> And you know what's even more disgusting than that? The, the closer they can do it, the, they want to do it with while the, the risk of being caught is there. They get off on that. That's what thrills them. Knowing somebody can walk through the door. Knowing that that parent might turn around. It's that bad. I mean, I, this isn't a pleasant subject. I don't like it, but woe to these people. Yeah. Jesus addressed it. Yeah. Yeah. And woe to the pedophile. And they're getting worse. You know, it used to be at least when they got sent to prison that at least somebody in there had the stones to take care of them. Yeah. But now even there, they separate them from the rest of the community. And they can't even, now no, no one even there can do, do what needs to be done. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not for vigilante justice, but good night. At least, at least some con in, in, in a federal prison has enough sense to know that that guy shouldn't be walking around yeah. hurting other kids. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Why can't the judge figure it out? Yeah. Why can't our own society figure it out? You know, woe to the injustice system that protects pedophiles. Yep. Woe to the American justice system. Yeah, right. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Let me read that again. It says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because when something bad and terrible is done that deserves to be have the hammer dropped on it, in a hard and swift manner, that when that does not happen, as is happening in our society today, when pedophiles or people should be drug out and shot without a moment's hesitation, yeah, amen. when that doesn't happen, when they're sent to be rehabilitated, you know, they're put on, you know, house arrest, whatever you want to call it, you know, because that's what's happening, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. I'm telling you something, the pedophile, the pervert, sits back and he weighs it out in his mind. If I do this, if I, if I get caught doing this, I'm going to go to jail. And you know what they say to themselves? It's worth it. It's worth it. And let me tell you something. By the time they get caught, that's not the first time. Yeah, exactly. That's why background checks don't work. Yep. All it tells you is that they finally got caught. But they sit there and they weigh it out in their mind. Oh, I might have to go to prison. We're all being separated from the, the general population. And yeah, I'll have a rap sheet, but after a few years, I'm taught, folks, yeah. Five years later, they're back out on the street. Yeah. They can go, you know, they just have to stay away from schools. They shouldn't be breathing air. Right. Amen. They should be executed. And that's, you know, they're going after strange flesh. They're reprobates. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, because that's not executed speedily, they weigh it out. They say, well, it's worth it. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? Don't do it again. Oh, gosh. Child's life is destroyed. Yeah. With. That stuff that happens, when that happens to children, their lives are destroyed. There are people that hate God because of that. They go, why does God let that happen? And they become bitter against God. And then they themselves become reprobates and go out and do the same thing. It's a vicious cycle because it is not executed speedily. And woe to them. And woe to those that would protect these kind of people. And that's, you know, that's, that's something... Uh, that really deserves a full sermon. But we have to keep going. Look there in verse 8, it says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. For it is better thee, uh, for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye than having, rather than having two eyes to cast, be cast into hell fire. You know, Jesus isn't teaching work salvation. He's not saying if you mutilate yourself, you can go to heaven. 
what he's saying here is that, you know, it'd be better for you to do that than, you know, if your hand is going to offend one of these little ones, it'd be better for you to cut it off. Yeah. If your eye is going to offend one of these little ones, it'd be better for you to pluck it out. And really another, you know, interpretation of this is that we could just imagine that, you know, where we could just, he's saying this because the horrors of hell are unimaginable. Yeah, that's right. He's saying, look, you can't even imagine. I mean, we hear, we can describe hell. The Bible talks about hell. We can preach about hell. We can be very passionate about hell and try to warn people and, and describe it to them, but we haven't even scratched the surface of the reality of hell. And when a person wakes up in hell, just how unimaginably horrific it would be. And Jesus is saying it would better, it'd be better for you to sit down with a hacksaw and start taking off body parts and pulling out your eyeballs than to go to that place. I mean, imagine that. If I came to you, those be, here's your options. Hell or, or go cut off a body part. And Jesus said, I'd cut off the body part. I mean, to actually sit down and do that. And say, well, at least it beats hell. I mean, I, I, hell's got to be pretty bad for yeah. him to say that. <clears throat> he says here in verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in, their, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now, that's an interesting verse. You know, and, and I can't, I don't think that we can really sit here and delve deep into the spiritual world here, but we can take it at face value and understand that, that children have an angel in heaven that beholds the face of the Father. Okay. I believe that they have that protect them and watch over them. And, you know, that's that's what that's what the verse says. I mean, I don't know really what, what more to preach about that. Other than that, maybe God cherishes the innocent. And that God has a special place for children in His heart because He knows that they're innocent and that they're vulnerable and that they're helpless and that the world is a wicked place. Yeah. And there's people out there that would offend them. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 11, For the Son of Man has come to seek that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, and he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine that went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So, I mean, we get asked that question a lot. You know, well, what happens? Not a lot, but people have this question. They say, well, does, what happens when a child who doesn't know any better dies? And the Bible's real clear that they go to heaven. I mean, David said that of, of the, the child that died as the, you know, God as a punishment took the life of the child uh, that, you know, Bathsheba gave birth to through means of adultery. What did David say? He said, you know, I shall go to be where he is, but he shall not come back and return to me. Right. And where did David go? He went, he went to heaven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and Job talks about it, and, you know, I think this is another place where it kind of alludes to that, that, you know, God, it's not God's will that one of them should perish, you know, not only, you know, in this life, you know, but also in, um, in, in that, they, that they go to heaven and they die. And another thing we can kind of get out of this is that God loves everyone, right? He, it's not it's not his will that one of these little ones should perish. And the fact is that everybody, even the worst person alive, I mean you can just imagine the most, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, just a wicked, filthy, vile reprobate, yeah. who's in hell today, at one time was a sweet little boy. Yeah. You know, one time he was somebody's little baby. And they looked at him, and maybe not, you know, but you imagine you know some of these people that have these, these just horrific people that they turned into. They were someone's precious little baby boy or girl that they just love. And, you know, God loves everybody at some point in their life, but there comes time when, when God ceases to love people. Amen. You know, and it's not when they're little ones. It's when they get old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. They understand God, and they start to reject God. And they start, you know, Romans 1 talks about that, and other sermons have been preached and will be preached about that. About the fact that people become the enemies of God. But well, yes, it's true, because people will, will throw that verse in our face sometimes and say, well, but does the Bible say that God loves the whole world? Yeah, He does. God loved everybody at one time. Well, you know, God also ceases to love people sometimes. Yeah. And God starts to actually hate people at some times. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a biblical doctrine. Look there in verse 15 where it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two, uh, one, with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, 
tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So this is an important verse or a passage to understand because this is one that's often abused by some people because some people don't understand that this is only one form of church discipline. I mean, sometimes people will get out, kicked out of a church and people will go, well, what about Matthew 18? Did you Matthew 18, the brother? Did you go to him privately? Look, this, this does not apply across the board every time somebody gets kicked out of church. This is, very, this is one instance of when somebody will be removed from the local body. And there's a procedure that takes place here. First of all, it says there that if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So this is you know something that's going on between two people. Now, there are other situations where people are removed from the church, okay? I'll read them to you. Romans 16, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Okay, it doesn't talk about going to them, imploring them, you know, taking witnesses to them, bringing them to church. It says, you know, if they're causing divisions, if they're preaching heresy, if they're causing offenses, we are to avoid them. That we are to put them out. Okay, that's another instance in where somebody would be removed from the local body. And this, you know, this is something that, unfortunately, people don't understand it because it's not put into practice. But here in 1 Corinthians 5, it's, it also talks about another means by which somebody would be put out from the local church. That would be if they are caught in grievous, certain specific sins. And not just any sin, I mean very specific sins. It's these sins that are listed. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called rather be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with one so not to eat. So not, uh, no not to eat. So there are certain people that, you know, at certain points, if they're caught in certain sins, they're supposed to be put out from the local assembly. And, you know, those that would be, you know, blasphemers, cause divisions, they are to be put out from the local assembly. So not every instance when somebody's kicked out of, the, uh, out of the local church do you invoke Matthew 18. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, someone's teaching some damnable heresy or is caught, you know, you know, committing fornication or some wicked sin, it doesn't make any sense to go to them, you know, because they haven't just offended you. They've offended God. They've offended, you know, the name of Christ. They've offended the body. I mean, they're teaching damnable heresies. There's people that, you know, creep in unawares to do that in the local churches. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to just say, well, you have to, every person that gets kicked out of church, you know, you have to take two witnesses and then you have to bring for the church. No, you don't. Yeah. And these passages prove that. There's more than one way to get kicked out of church. <laughs> I don't suggest we try any of them. But, you know, that, that, that's true. You see, it says there, it's if thy brother shall trespass against thee. This is talking about a trespass between two parties in like a personal manner. And I believe a lot of times it's talking about if they were to trespass against you in, you know, in the matter of like physical property or money or a business deal or something like that. You know, not, not so-and-so came to church and gave me a nasty look. And I went and I told them, I said, you offended me. And they wouldn't hear me. So then I took two or three witnesses. And, and you still wouldn't hear them. And now we're going to go before the church and we're going to talk about how brother so-and-so gave other brother so-and-so a nasty look. Or didn't shake his hand. Or didn't bring anything to the potluck. You know, and I'm offended. You know, it, it's, it's, it's specific. You know, it's, it's, it's not just any time somebody offends you in the local church. And let me just forewarn everybody, you know, if we spend enough time around each other, you know, some of us are going to, well, eventually someone's going to have a bad day around here and come to church you know, someone's going to have to go to IHOP with their family and sit behind two faggots, like I did, and have to come back here and try to put a smile on their face. You know, and you know, if you notice why I was a little cranky this, this afternoon when I came back, that's why. Because I have to go out and just vex myself looking at, you know, homos in public. And uh, anyway, <laughs> got that off my chest. <laughs> so, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that somebody, you know, eventually you're going to have a bad day, or somebody else is going to have a bad day, and you're going to come to church, and someone's going to say something that you don't appreciate, or they're not going to shake your hand, or whatever. There's so many things that if we're so sensitive about, yeah. and wear our feelings on our sleeves, that, you know, eventually you're going to get offended. Because we're people, you know, and people, you know, they're not always what they should be. But, you know, welcome to reality. Amen. And so we can't, we can't just take that and run with Matthew 18 and say, well, every time somebody offends me, you know. And here's the thing. And sometimes it's funny because people who want to implore Matthew 18 the most have like the least, they don't even understand when Matthew 18 is happening. 
I've seen this with my own two eyes where somebody comes to them and says, I've had to be the witnesses on, on more than one occasion. You know, and it's not fun. I don't, I don't enjoy that, watching one, two people have to sit there and try and resolve some conflict. You know, that's, you know, and just be there to, to witness how it goes down. But the people that will sit there, well, Matthew 18, Matthew 18, and Matthew 18 is going down right in front of them. And they don't even have the, the enough sense to realize that they've offended somebody legitimately. And, you know, there are legitimate offenses. You know, when you start to attack, you know, church leadership, in, you know, whether directly or, you know, via family members, you know, I've seen people attack, you know, children of, of church leadership and go after them. That, you are, that is an attack on, the, on church leadership. That's an attack on the pastor. You know, because the qualifications of a bishop are that he rules his house well. Yep. So, you know, mark that, keep that in mind when we decide to start getting a critical spirit about somebody or decide to start attacking somebody, you know, that you might end up offending the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. And then you might find yourself having to give an account for that. And, if, you know, it's just, it's crazy if people, when they realize they offended somebody, because Matthew 18 is like, this is like the most opportunity to get it right. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 5, that's like, there's not a lot of mercy there. It's like, you did this, you're out, go get it right, and maybe you can come back if you're really sorry about it and you got yourself right. You know, the first, you know, the first Corinthians 5, the guy who's committing one of these sins, you know, drunkenness, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, extortion, or whatever, that person can go out and get it right and come back. Sometimes that's not easy to do. The Matthew 18 person, it's like, they get several opportunities here. First of all, they get it one-on-one -on -one with the person that they've offended. And, you know, hopefully if somebody's got enough sense, that's where it ends. Yeah. You know, someone comes to you and says, hey, you know what? I noticed the other day when you were leaving here that you backed out of your parking space and, and ran right into my car and I've got a dent. Here's the bill. You know, well, you know, and, and well, I didn't know. Well, I saw you do it. We got it on camera. Whatever. You know, that type of thing. I'm not saying yeah. But that's the kind of thing that happens. That's your opportunity to get Matthew 18 right. Right there. If you don't, then it moves on to the next stage. Where two or three people are brought. You know, the bill's presented. The evidence is presented. And then it's like, no. Still not going to pay it. Still not my fault. Didn't happen. Going to lie. And then it's, then it's before the whole church. But you can see how you've had several opportunities to get it right. Whereas in these other instances, it's just... The hammer, you're out. You know that it's pretty quick. So when he's talking about here in Matthew 18, we don't want to just run with that and just say, you know, every time somebody gets kicked out of church, that you know they deserve the opportunity to go before two witnesses, go before the church. That's not that's not how it works. But when it when it is a legitimate Matthew 18 kind of moment where it is an offense between two people of some type, that's a legitimate offense, then. You know, we have to we have to understand that we need to resolve. There's some things that need to be resolved in church. You know, the Bible's real clear about this. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, there are certain things that we need to resolve in church. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Here any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? You know, there should never be a lawsuit between between church members. And that happens. I've seen I've seen churches split, people suing each other across the aisle, and taking one taking brethren to court over the church building and church over it's crazy. The things that go on in church are probably because somebody wanted a different color carpet. It's the most stupid carnal things that people get bent out of shape over. And some, you know, the deacon board wants it one way, and the people want it another, and the pastor wants it another way, and they end up going to court. And then, you know, Paul's addressing it. He says, if you have a matter, why go you to the law before the unjust? I mean, do you want know the type of people that are involved in the judicial system? Yeah. They're the type of people that put pedophiles in jail for five years and let them go. Yeah. But we're going to go to them and ask them to resolve some financial matter or some kind of, you know, something between brethren and church. Why can't we just resolve it here? Why can't we just say, hey, let's have a church meeting. Brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so have offended one another. Here's the evidence. We've got the witnesses. This is how it happened. Let's make a judgment right now. And if brother so-and-so doesn't want to go along with it, then he's out. You know, that's Matthew 18. See ya. 
you know, it's unfortunate because the one who's been robbed, the one who's been offended, doesn't get any kind of restitution. But you're not going to find that in the world either, are you? No. When you go out there and fill out a police report for stolen property, and they catch the guy, you know, the, the, the judicial system, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the prison system, the incarceration system, they're going to make plenty of money off of it. You're not. You're not going to get your property back four or five folds like the Bible says you should. You know, you're not going to make a gain out of having lost money or whatever the property was. But they'll throw him in jail and they'll profit from him being there and feeding him and clothing him. And, you know, that whole system is just a, just to make money. So let's not take one another to court. Let's not go to law before the unjust and for the unsaved and, and sue the daylights out of each other when we can resolve these things right here in the church. It says uh, in verse 3, Know ye not, we shall judge angels how much more the things that pertain to this life. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them who are judged uh, are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one which shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother go to law with brother, and that before un the unbelievers. Know therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be frauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. He's saying it would be better to take the dumbest guy in church and let him figure it out. Take the least wise guy there is, the least amount of discernment, and let him judge it than to go before the unbelievers. Because you're going to defraud. And let me just say this. this is, maybe this is just kind of a little bit from left field, but this is something that needs to be said, okay? Because people do this and they make huge mistakes and they ruin their lives. Never call the police on your spouse. Yeah. Never. I mean, I've heard, I, I can tell you, people who call their police, they regret it. And, you know, and it seems like at the time, you know, someone's getting violent. You know, by all means, get away from that person. You know, get away. Try to spare your life and limb. But sometimes I wonder how bad it really got before you called the police. Like, oh, he had my, he, did he have his hands around your neck and, you know, you're gasping your last breath and you dialed 911? Probably not. You know, it was probably a heated argument. You know, something got thrown. Someone got a little too rough and now sudden it's, it's called the police. The police are going to show up because guess what? Then the state presses charges. Yeah. You can't drop the charges. Once they have you, once they have that spouse in the system, they're theirs. And they're going to they're gonna put that guy away. Because why? Because they want to make money. That's what that system exists for. And they're not going to care what you say. You know, oh, I changed my mind. I love him. I want him back. You know, he was just drunk, whatever. We'll work it out. Too late. Yeah. You know, too late. He's in county. It's, it's over. Yeah. And you think that never happens. I'm telling you. I know. I can, I can tell you about people where it's happened. I've, 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 I've made that phone call to somebody and had to listen to that sob story. And you, what can you tell them? Sorry. What do you want me to do about it? You know, I don't have a magic wand. Let me just pull out the Bible and wave it around and say some magic words. You know, there's no flux capacitor in the Bible, right? Yeah. Go back time and go help you. You know, you should have thought of that beforehand. Yeah. You know, you should have been in church before you messed up your life. So you could have learned these type of things. How to have a good marriage. You know, and I'm sorry you married the guy, but you married the guy. You know, and, and, and there's always more to the, to the story, but I don't want to go off too much on that. But, you know, so when we're talking about the fact that we shouldn't go to law amongst brethren, you know, don't go to law against your spouse. It's just, you, you will regret it. You know, never call the cops. The cops are not there to protect you. So, you know, the, the, this is what we get out of this, this chapter here is, you know, quite a bit. There's, and one thing we need to learn here is that there's a way to handle strife within the church. There's a way to handle, you know, heresy. You know, there's certain ways that certain sins are dealt with. And then we should not be going to law with brethren. Don't do it. You know, in Matthew 18, we saw it's really, it's not, it's reserved for very specific circumstances where there's an offense between two parties, between one person and another. That's what it's there for. It's not there for every, every wolf in sheep's clothing that comes in and starts teaching some damnable heresy. Or some guy who wants to just, you know, get drunk and be a fornicator. It's not, that's not who Matthew 18 is for. That's who Romans 16, or uh, excuse me, uh, that's who, yeah, Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 5 is for. That's, that's their, their passages. Now, let's go ahead and move on here to verse 18 where the Bible reads, Verily I say unto you, uh, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, if you recall, just a few passages back, that's the same thing that 
Jesus said to the Apostle Peter. And really at the time, I don't think I really addressed it then, but I think what this really means is that you know, this is Jesus giving authority unto the disciples. This is Jesus giving authority unto the local church. Him saying, you know, whatever you... I mean, because we have the book to go by, right? We, and, it, you know, there are those of us in the church and the people within a body of a church that can make decisions that God will honor. You know, that He will say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. You know, we use the Spirit, we use the, 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 the discernment of God's Word to make decisions on here on earth. And God approves of those. He says, I will uphold it in heaven. You know, if you loose it on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. If you bind it in earth, it will be bound in heaven. So I think that's really what that verse is, you know, what he's referring to there is the fact that, you know, Jesus has, you know, uh, given authority unto the local church through the disciples and the leadership. And he says in verse 19, I get, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay, now that's, uh, that's not, that is not uh, your uh, life verse for house church. You know, verse 20. Well, you know, do you go to church anywhere? Well, you know, I get together with my buddies and wherever we are. You know, we go out to deer camp and, you know, that's where I have my church. Out in the woods. <laughs> you know, with my buddies hunting. That's not church. That's right. That's where two or three of you are gathered together. That's not the local assembly. You know, that's that's something different. Now it's true where two or three of you are gathered together, there he is in the midst of you. But that doesn't mean it's church. Does he say, well, that's church? No, that's not what he says, but people run with that. And he says in verse 21, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times? you got to kind of wonder the motive here. Like, why? You know, who are you keeping track of, Peter? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto until seven times, but until seventy seven until seventy times seven. You know, now that's not as Jesus isn't giving a specific number so that we can keep track. You know, you've got your little tally mark. You know? Uh-huh. Oh, oh yeah? Shake my hand today, didn't you? I'll forgive you this time, but just keep it up. And you know when seventy times seven comes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let you have it. You know, that's not what he's saying. He's just saying that you should be there is no end to the forgiveness that we should have. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain man, a certain king, excuse me, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But as for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children and all that he had a payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. I mean, that's a pretty generous guy. I mean, that was pretty compassionate of him. I mean, he, the debt was so bad that he could have sold him and his whole family to pay for it. Yeah. And he says, you know what? I'll take the hit. I forgive you. Just because he felt like it, just because of compassion. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on, laid his hands on him and took him by the throat. I mean, it wasn't even... I mean, there's, there's trying to get somebody's attention, you know, grabbing them by the arm or something, but when you're grabbing somebody by the throat, man, you, you must be really mad. <laughs> Saying, pay me what thou, that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Boy, that should have sounded familiar to this guy. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till she had paid the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told him to the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And remember, this parable is an answer to Peter's question. How oft should I should forgive my brother? Well, consider how much God has forgiven you. You know, consider how many times God has overlooked your transgressions. Yeah. How much of your sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. How much He's cast behind His back. Amen. And said, you know, I forget about it. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to make you pay me to pay for that. Amen. You know, that's that's yeah, that's what we have to keep in mind. You know, should I forgive so and so? Well, I don't know. Should you? Has God ever forgiven you for anything? Yeah. I mean, have we ever messed up in our life and said, you know, that was wrong, and got down on our knees and said, God. You know, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I confess that sin. I forsake that sin. And we go about our and we have the joy of His salvation restored unto us. And we go out, we serve God, and we have the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
And we know that that, you know, that the, 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 the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. And how many times have you done that, but then so-and-so, somebody that you know, it, you know, offends you in some way, and it's just like, well, I'm not going to forgive him. You know, that's, that's the, 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 uh, the answer that Jesus gives. And it just sounds to me like you should be willing to forgive pretty much anything and everything. And as often as you need to. And his Lord was wroth with them, in verse 34, and delivered him to his, the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye forgive from your hearts not everyone his brother their trespasses. I mean, I, I don't want to be delivered unto the tormentors. I mean, is God literally going to cast you to the tormentors? You know, like throw you into a prison and have you tortured? No. But I mean, you think about the fact that people who are willing, uh, you know, the Bible says that bitterness is, uh, uh, rotteth the bones. You know, people who are bitter and don't forgive, I mean, it's like they're tormented by it. They're just so bent and just so angry and so mad and they just live the rest of their life just hating somebody and they just can't get over some offense that happened 20 years ago and they're just not going to give it up and they're just never going to let them forget how they did them dirty. And you know what? They're the ones that are being tormented by that because they won't forgive. You know, if we forgive people for the things that they do wrong to us, you know, we don't have to sit there and live our lives a bunch of bitter, angry people. We don't have to be tormented with those feelings, those emotions of, you know, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. That's the torment that a lot of people suffer when they're unwilling to forgive. That's how God torments people. He lets them just turn into bitter, angry, you know, just nasty people. And man, they're out there. And, and you run into them, and they're just, just the nastiest people to be around. And it's because somebody somewhere along the line did something they didn't approve of, that they didn't like, and they were just never going to let it go. They're going to just hang on to that. Well, you know what? Don't forget. And see where it leads. See if God just doesn't let you torment yourself with that kind of an attitude. And really, the, 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 the lesson to learn here is that, you know, if we desire mercy, we should be willing to show mercy. Yeah. You know, God said, I will be merciful unto him that showeth mercy, and forward unto him that showeth himself forward. You know, if we want to be mercy, if we want God's mercy, and let me tell you something, there's going to come a time in your life when you need mercy. Yeah. A very good chance of it, because we're all sinners. You know, if not on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, if we're trying to be right with God and walk the line with Him, we're going to need mercy from God at some point. And if we're unmerciful people, I, you know, God might just treat you the same way and say, you know, I know you need mercy right now, but I remember when someone else needed mercy from you and you wouldn't need it. And he's going to, you know, so shall, likewise shall my fa Heavenly Father do unto you. And really the key to that verse, because a lot of us understand that, a lot of people get it, and they say, well, yeah, I'll forgive them. And they want to be forgiving people. But it says there, if you forgive from your hearts. And that's really a big key here. That it's not just, it's not just words. I forgive you. <laughs> no, it's okay. You know, really, it's nothing. You know, <laughs> It's water off a duck's back. <laughs> you know, and they just... That's not forgiveness, folks. Just saying the words. Yeah. I forgive you. It's okay. That's not how it works. It's from your heart. Yeah. It has to be genuine. How do you know if you've really forgiven somebody in your heart? You don't remember it. It's, it you can't, it's, it's forgive and forget. That's the true test of whether or not you've really forgiven somebody for something. Amen. If you can forget about it. Yeah. If someone brings it up later, you're like, man, I totally forgot that even happened. You know, and I know that I've been able to do that, and I know in some other instances I haven't. And we, if we're all honest, that's probably a lot of us could say that. And I know that I've offended other people, and, and that, they, that I've been an offense to them, and they forgave me. And I remember I've mentioned, and somehow it came up in conversation, I said, well, you remember, you know, and they'll, they'll look at me like, what are you talking about? And I'll have to remember, oh, yeah. And that's how I know that person really forgave me. Because they didn't even remember what I did. Yeah. It's totally forgot. And that's exactly the way it is with God. When He forgives us, He's not just like, yeah, I forgive you, but I got it written down right here. You know, if you ever step out of line, I'll remind you about it. <laughs> no, the Bible says that God has cast our, you know, as, as far as the east is from the west, so far He has separated us from our iniquities. Amen. He's cast these things behind His back. They're in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Never to be mentioned unto us again. Amen. He's not going to impute us unto us our right, our, our, our iniquities ever again. He's forgotten about them. That is true forgiveness. When you can forgive somebody, 
and you don't even remember what it is you forgave them for, or that you ever even forgave them. So that's really the key to it right there. I mean, we want to be compassionate people. We want to be forgiving people. And if we want to do that, we have to do it from our hearts. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.